Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Live with Leadership, 40 Years of HIV Federal Leadership. This webinar is being recorded and is not for press. We urge all participants to ask their questions throughout the session using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical related issues, you can put those in the chat box and someone will try to assist you with your needs. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Timothy Harrison to begin our session. Great, thank you. Welcome to the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policies Live with Leadership. I am Tim Harrison, the Deputy Director for Strategic Initiatives and Senior Policy Advisor in the office. Uh, this month, we are commemorating several things. The 40th anniversary of HIV, long-term HIV uh, Survivors Awareness Day, National HIV Testing Day, and Pride Month. As part of marking the 40th anniversary of HIV, the U.S. government is reflecting on the many lives we've lost to AIDS and rededicating ourselves in their honor. We are recommitting ourselves to the work that must be done. We are re-engaging with people with lived experience and a wide variety of stakeholders from all sectors of society and re-energizing our efforts to accelerate progress and ensure equity. This afternoon, we'll be talking to two long-term, long-time federal employees and leaders in our nation's response to HIV. I'm so excited to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Merman from the Centers for Disease Control, for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and Dr. Laura Cheever from the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. Let's begin. I want to introduce Dr. Laura Cheever, Associate Administrator for the HIV AIDS Bureau at HRSA. Dr. Cheever, please tell us about your experience with the earlier days of HIV and how you became involved with the government's efforts. Uh, great, uh, thanks so much for that. Um, well, I think it really uh, begins that I went into medicine because I was very interested in social justice. And from my perspective, I was gonna pursue international health. Um, but during my training in the early 1990s, I was working in San Francisco. And um, the impact there of the HIV epidemic was so compelling that I changed the direction and began to work in HIV. Uh, so that work with HIV brought me back to Baltimore uh, for my infectious disease training in the mid 90s. Um, when suddenly we had this miracle of highly active antiretroviral therapy um, and for me, really, the trajectory of HIV changed. Um, but I was in a position uh, working where I could see clearly that those most in need were not going to get access to this incredibly new drug, these incredible drugs. And in fact, in the earliest days, there were huge disparities in who actually could access antiretrovirals and became what we later found would be undetectable. Um, because I was, I was so passionate about this, and I was working specifically with people who were addicted to crack and injecting heroin at that time. I worked in a, a methadone program as well as an HIV clinic. Um, I, became, I became a member of the Baltimore Planning Council, which is part of the Ryan White program, to really make sure people who had addiction uh, were receiving services proportionate to their, to their needs through the Ryan White program. Um, that eventually led me to HRSA as a HRSA employee, where I began working over 20 years ago. And, and though I never really imagined government service, and I wasn't, um, I was a little anxious about being in the government, I thought I would do it for just a couple of years, and now it's been, uh, in, I'm in the 20s. <laughs> and that's really because Ryan White is such an amazing program, and it's really been an honor to be a part of it, both as a grant recipient in Baltimore, implementing programs and now as a federal employee trying to make the program better. So it's really all the people in the field that do incredible work and uh, the, 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 peop the consumers that we are engaging in that keep me going in the program. So I want to thank everyone for that. And thank you for your commitment. Um, I'd like to ask a similar question to Dr. Jonathan Merman. Uh, Dr. Merman is the director of the National Center for HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, STD, and TB prevention at the CDC. Uh, Dr. Merman, same question to you. Please tell us about your experience with the earlier days of HIV and, and how you became involved with the government's efforts. Thanks, Mr. Harrison. I, I also wanted to add on one special holiday to your list, which is Juneteenth for the first time will be celebrated as a federal holiday um, this year. And... Uh, I think in the world of HIV, that means a lot. 
Absolutely. Um, so so uh, similar to Dr. Cheever, I grew up in a world with HIV touching all aspects of my life. Um, I was in college in 1985, a year that about 8,000 people died of AIDS in the US. Uh, and the Boston Globe published a letter recommending that people with AIDS be forcibly tattooed and quarantined on an island off the coast of Massachusetts. And I felt this overwhelming desire to do something productive. Uh, so I dropped out of college for a year, uh, an action that I, that I, that I think I, most teenagers believe is somehow making a point. And, and I worked full time on AIDS policy and behavior change for a new collaboration between the Harvard Schools of Government Medicine and Public Health. And I never left HIV. Um, it, it wraps itself around all aspects of our lives, uh, sex, love, compassion, equity, discrimination, human rights. Uh, like Dr. Cheever, I was compelled by a, a, a sense of pursuing justice, of making the world a better place, and of working with and supporting people who others would not. Um, so I went to medical school and residency in the San Francisco Bay Area because I wanted the skills that would make me a compassionate, good doctor. And I learned to take care of people with HIV in my primary care clinic and on Ward 86. But, but I also wanted to change the structures that enabled HIV to spread, the discrimination and homophobia that caused so much unnecessary pain. And I wanted to use science to improve public health. So I joined CDC as an epidemic intelligence service officer and later found myself working for CDC in Uganda and Kenya for 10 years, uh, working with partners to push the envelope of HIV prevention, to bring ART to Africa and support the relationship between policy, program and research. And after that, I came back to the U.S. to work uh, in HIV at CDC and with the HIV community here in the U.S. Um, after 40 years, I, I, I think the HIV community still challenges the status quo. Uh, there are brilliant, committed, um, and vocal colleagues who ask why we can't do better. Uh, friends, family, and millions of people in the world with the virus remind all of us why we work in this field. And, and I believe that a lot has changed in HIV since the 1980s. We... We have highly effective treatment and PrEP, incidence is declining, marriage equality is in full force, uh, and syringe service programs are becoming mainstream. But we also have massive disparities that continue to challenge our sense of justice. And it did not surprise me that many of our heroes in HIV rose to the occasion with COVID-19. Uh, we have a, a track record for running towards controversial, meaningful work. And, and sometimes we suffer for it, but I believe um, all of the people who are on this call have the hearts and the wills that have been forged in the world of hardship and passion of HIV. And I expect that 40 years from now, we still will. Thank you for that. And thank you for your commitment over all these years. Um, and before we turn to get some questions from our audience, I just had a few questions, if you don't mind, for the both of you to continue this discussion. And, and this, this is for both of you. Uh, and I believe, Dr. Rimmer, you, you referenced this, the issue of disparities. Um, and obviously, over the years, we've seen a lot of change in the, in the last decades. But one thing that has been similar throughout the HIV epidemic is that significant disparities exist, HIV infections and outcomes for people with HIV. And this really continues today. Can you each speak to specific actions you think we can take as a nation to, to address these inequities that still exist? Yeah, so I guess I'll leave here. Um, well, it's interesting, as uh, Jonna was talking, I, ref I reflected back on that people were surprised initially when Af African-American Latinx people were significantly impacted by COVID. And I think anyone that worked in HIV was not surprised. Mm -hmm. um, the social determinants of health, which are based in poverty, lack of housing, food, transportation, are propped up in the U.S. Uh, for HIV and other diseases by the issues um, John touched on, like systemic racism, homophobia, transphobia, se transphobia sexism, and HIV-related stigma. I think those are all um, real drivers of inequities. I think the dialogue, the national dialogue we've had in the last year is really a first step. Uh, necessary but not adequate in addressing uh, the inequities of HIV. Um, that said, in HRSA, the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, um, uh, because I think it provides a, a comprehensive system that includes both HIV primary care, medications, and essential support services, over half of people that live with HIV in the US 
um, really since its passage has been a program that's been focused on health equity, uh, stopping stigma, reducing health disparities. Um, and we've been, I think we, I mean, the people that are working in the field every day in and day out have been able to do this because they take a patient-centered approach to their care. Um, where they're listening uh, to what are the needs of the community and addressing those. Um, specifically, we've had to look at data and we're gonna to continue to have to look at data to know where we have disparities and how to help close those disparity gaps. Um, in the Ryan White program, by focusing really on outcomes and disparities, um, we've been able to improve our viral suppression rate from about 70% to 81% in the last decade and reduce disparity gaps. We still have disparities, but they're closing, but that's because people have been focused on um, key populations and what people need, meeting people where they are. A good example of that is um, uh, that for taking care of transgender individuals, many times you need to do what they, what those patients want when they come into care. If that's hormones and you start with hormones and you come to HIV later. Um, and so we've, it's been a sort of a slow slog to get there, but I think we have really continue to embrace those lessons learned as we move forward. And um, it, we've had some impacts, but we're not gonna get anywhere until we better address those underlying issues of, of racism, homophobia, transphobia, and um, HIV stigma. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Merwin, same question. Well, I, 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 um, I strongly agree with Dr. Cheever that um, what we've seen with the COVID-19 epidemic is that the nation's policies, structures, and social environment will inherently create an inequitable situation unless we explicitly and thoughtfully work against it. So we saw major racial and ethnic disparities in the beginning of COVID-19, and we saw them lessen over time. Uh, with HIV, we also see major disparities, um, but we've seen that with concerted effort, they can be ameliorated. So, um, and I will say, by the way, up front that it's better and easier if we prevent them from occurring in the first place. But you know, 10 years ago, we saw the highest incidence of HIV in the nation was among African-American MSM below the age of 25. And with efforts, we dramatically reduced that incidence by over 30%. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to see decreases because we've, we've been bringing services to people instead of insisting that people come to services. Um, I, I think that technology is important. You know, the, the advances in antiretroviral therapy and in PrEP um, and in testing diagnostics have allowed us to do better, but they only work if they're available to people. And if the structures that um, currently prevent people from accessing those services are turned around to become enabling support systems, then we will succeed. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll Great. just add, if I may just add on to that, John, I think you and I've had this discussion before that is as long as we, we, uh, we need to take a sex positive approach, right? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna prevent HIV, which is largely sexually transmitted, we need a sex positive approach to our work. And so um, we're getting there. We have some great examples, mm -hmm. I think in New York City and other places where from a public health perspective, we've been able to, 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 to sort of reframe in a way that I think will be necessary if we're ever gonna go forward and really mm -hmm. get things like PrEP highly implemented in the US. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Cheever, we know that the Ryan White program has focused on the needs of those aging with HIV. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your efforts and the resources available? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've got to say that in the Ryan White program, we were very focused and continue to be very focused on viral suppression because people that are virally suppressed, it means we've identified them as having HIV, um, gotten them on medication, helped them stay on medication over time and take their medication regularly have access to their medication. So it's a huge thing to be virally suppressed. Someone who's virally suppressed will live a near normal lifespan with HIV and they have effectively no risk of sexually transmitting it. So it's a great thing uh, for patients, patients. Um, and so it's been our goal. Uh, multiple community members um, brought it to our attention that, um, that by, by solely focusing on HIV, on, on viral suppression, we weren't particularly focusing on people over 50 because 91% of people over 50 are virally suppressed. So um, uh, and, and some of our programming, you know, 10 years ago, was very much like check the box, they're doing great. Um, and we were focused on youth and other groups. But when we looked at our data and really based on input from community, um, we saw that um, the proportion of our clients that are over 50 has increased from about 32% in 2010 to 47% in, in, um, in 2019. So over a decade, a huge increase in people over 50, which is completely to be celebrated. 
right? People are living long, healthy lives with HIV. Um, it's great. Um, but we definitely heard from community that older people were having significant uh, different kinds of struggles, um, including one that they had multiple comorbidities that weren't necessarily being well managed with their um, in their program in their Ryan White programs that um, that they had increasing needs like frailty that were occurring at an accelerated rate in HIV and they weren't getting properly addressed. So um, we've done several things. First, we have a CDC HRSA advisory committee that um, John and I chair together. Um, that had a subcommittee that really focused specifically on aging and HIV and giving us input as to what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we convened a te technical expert panel with healthcare expert, experts, people living with HIV, really focusing on what were the multiple types of barriers and um, facilitators for people getting in care and having um, good, remaining to have good full lives as they live into older age with HIV. Um, we put out some documents around um, what are those in incorporating new elements into care to address issues of people aging and how to make sure the healthcare team, which is fundamental in Ryan White, was really uh, being put together in a way that best met the needs of people. Um, more recently, I think the most important thing we've done is uh, there's a part of, a, of HHS, Health and Human Services, called the Administration for Community Living, which really focuses on older people. Um, and they have a tremendous amount of expertise in the community today. We have a tremendous amount of expertise um, um, about uh, managing and helping people as they grow old in the community. Um, the Ryan White program is not very well linked to those sets of services. So really, how do we get the expertise from the administration of community living in those community-based organizations who have been doing this work for decades and link them to the Ryan White program to make sure that our Ryan White recipients can really benefit from that expertise in the field. So we're very much uh, focused on that right now. I think we're making um, some pretty good progress, but obviously um, we have much more to learn. Um, people as they age with HIV are pioneers, right? That we haven't had uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people living into their 80s with HIV, and we will in the coming decade, which is super exciting. Um, and so we need to make sure we're learning and quickly adapting um, to those lessons learned. Thank you for that for a really, really thoughtful answer and response. Uh, Dr. Merman, uh, CDC uh, recently released new data uh, that showed we're beginning to make uh, some pro um, progress on increasing uptake, excuse me, of PrEP. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about this new data and tell us about CDC's efforts to continue making strides on PrEP usage for all populations? Mm -hmm. uh, so Tim, PrEP reminds us that cutting edge science can create powerful tools for change, but they need to be available and used to be useful. So um, PrEP use has increased dramatically over the past few years. Uh, and now about a little over 20% of the people that CDC estimates as being eligible are taking it. Um, that's not enough. In addition, when we look at the data, we still see major racial and ethnic disparities um, that uh, white Americans are much more likely than Latinos who are more likely than African-Americans um, who to be taking PrEP. Um, and HHS, your office and other partners have made energetic efforts to, to change the situation, partially by changing the environment, including ensuring an uninsured people can access PrEP. Um, uh, federally qualified health centers um, have it available. Uh, it, we've been initiating federal policy that PrEP has to be provided by insurers with no copay and are emphasizing that that includes uh, the uh, other testing and other services that are required uh, to appropriately provide PrEP. Um, and we've been implementing communications campaigns. So uh, I think all of us are committed to kind of to, to, to do better with PrEP because we see it as an important tool alongside treatment and other prevention efforts. I, I think that, um, that you know, HIV is a space where we have done our best over time in a fragmented healthcare system to have what is universal support for people with HIV. And now what we're seeing is the same thing for PrEP, that it, it's not a Ryan White care program, but we're trying to through US Preventive Services Task Force recommendations, through concerted efforts, through um, the Bureau of Primary Healthcare at HRSA, through others, through CDC's guidelines, we're trying to make it so that PrEP is also easily available 
to the people who would benefit from it so that the, um, the obstacles to taking it are as small as possible and it becomes a natural part of what people do. I, I will say that earlier today, I was talking to Greg Millett and he mentioned that he thought that PrEP was one of the most important interventions in the past um, a few years to decrease stigma. So there are potentially collateral benefits to both treatment and U equals U and PrEP for stigma. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, before we turn it over to uh, the audience for some questions, I just want to end with a final question to both of you. Um, and you've already talked about your, your decades of experience working in this field. And now as we enter the fifth decade of dealing with HIV in the U.S., and around the globe, what gives you hope that we can end this epidemic? You know, who wants to, to I, start? I, 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 <laughs> Laura, Laura, usually you, you, we've been all saying, but I will, I will start off with just, I would say that, um, that, you know, in one sense, it's, it's hard to still be working in HIV. Um, I think, I think language shows us that. We used to be the pandemic, and now there's another one um, that people you know, use the word for. And I think that, that um, the extraordinary um, impact of HIV that we saw every day 30 years ago um, is not being felt by the whole nation. However, I would say that all the people on this call, many of the colleagues, um, still care and the highest levels of government still care. And we have come so far, HIV incidence has decreased by 73% from the highest number of infections in the mid 1980s. And we've even documented a recent decrease of about 8%. So it's slow, but we're on the right path. And we're at a point in this nation where we are talking about and acting against racism and systemic barriers. Um, we are prioritizing decreasing disparities by the, the the, you know, the top leaders of our, of our government and the head of CDC has made health equity um, one of her top goals. We have new scientific tools that we've already talked about that, um, and we actually have some that are, that are soon to be available, like a once a month pill for PrEP and a once a week and long acting implants for PrEP and ART. So I think that there, there's, um, there's an, an environment that will allow us to continue to succeed as we move into the fifth decade, but we have to continue to care about it. Yeah, I completely agree with you, John, everything that you said. Um, it's really exciting because I think we, we embarked on this ending the HIV epidemic initiative in the federal government because we realized we did have the tools to end the HIV epidemic mm -hmm. um, between um, PrEP and, and between testing and PrEP and needle exchange and HIV treatment and being better able to get people, have people access care and remaining care over time, we have the tools. So that is really exciting. We've also learned a tremendous amount during this COVID-19 pandemic. Things like telemedicine have been a game changer for many people with HIV. Um, but I think most significantly, as you said, it's really this conversation around systemic racism. And from my perspective, and I think this administration is, is, is working on this, it's to really leverage this moment about addressing racism as a foothold to address social determinants of health that are really, I think, the major barriers um, to ending the HIV epidemic in this country. So I think we're right at the sort of doorstep and I'm really excited. I've never been as hopeful as I am now about ending the epidemic. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, we're gonna now turn and see what our virtual audience has for questions, what, what are they interested in? A reminder, please ask your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll go to the first question here and pull that up. Uh, ha, stigma. How do you think the stigma in the society and or stereotyping of the virus as present only in specific groups of society affects the spread of awareness about the virus? Is it getting better? Who likes to take that on? I mean, I, I can I can start. I think um, I think that uh, there's a natural tendency in humans 
to try to separate themselves from disease, however possible, and to discriminate against others if available. So um, when we start seeing disparities um, in a variety of different fashions, not just racial and ethnic, um, we, th there are parts of society that will um, increase stigma and sometimes discrimination against people because they don't, they want to be able to separate themselves from risk. I, I also, um, I do think it's getting better. And I think in some ways HIV has been the model for that by empowering people who were affected. Um, they become um, sources of change and control and, and honor. And, um, and we can see that with people living with HIV throughout the world. And um, in the United States, still so much leadership is, um, is, is represented by people who, who have HIV. And so I think that it is better. I still think there is stigma. I think we have um, certain situations that we could do better with like HIV criminalization laws, which we've come out very explicitly that should be revised um, and things that, that, that if done would decrease stigma. Um, and I also think, as we mentioned earlier, that sometimes um, there's a collateral benefit to some of the interventions like U equals U or PrEP that end up um, decreasing some of the, the stigma, but it's difficult. It's difficult to have an illness and also find yourself marginalized by others. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. The other piece too, is that if people do this other thing so that older people can't get HIV, that's their perspective, right? It's only for younger people so that we have older people that get diagnosed very, very late because they and their doctors are not thinking about it. So um, I think that some of the, the gay rights movements and marriage equality and um, increasing, uh, increasing representation of trans and, and non-gender uh, conforming people in society, in, in various parts of society also helps uh, to sort of humanize everyone. And I think in that sense, that we're, we're working to decrease stigma. But I think that people themselves um, often uh, have a lot of, um, suffer a lot of pathology and misdiagnosis because it's always the other. Great, great. Uh, let's, let's turn uh, to the Ryan White program. Uh, uh, we have a question here. The Ryan White program does an amazing job at improving viral suppression rates. But the inequities that are being discussed lead to many lead to people not being in or staying in care and therefore not therefore not virally suppressed. What tangible steps are CDC and HRSA taking to re-engage or better engage more people in care? Yeah, that's a great question. I hope you can hear me. My dogs, of course, have decided <laughs> that now is the moment to bark. But um, that's a great question. So in the ending the HIV epidemic initiative, the purpose of those new funds coming into community is really to reach people we have not yet reached. And so we know there are a lot of missed opportunities. We've had a lot of, like the Ryan White program has essentially been maintained in its funding for, for 10 years as the cost of medical care has gone up. So now that we have new funding moving into communities, um, they can focus, many communities are already doing it. They're focusing on very specific activities that they know have worked and bringing them to scale. So things like better linking people as they transition from jail and prison back into HIV care, or people that transition from, from, uh, from um, uh, pediatric care into adult care. Um, so we are definitely doing that as well as really uh, taking lessons learned over the last 10 years around using data to care and looking at where people are out of care um, and identifying it more quickly and moving more quickly to re-engage them. So, um, we're, we've already made in, uh, in communities significant progress, even during COVID in, in making those things happen. Mm -hmm. and, and Tim, mm -hmm. um, rather than answer that question, because we only have a short time left, there was a really interesting question in the chat um, that, that mentioned that, that the person was, um, who we know well, was actually happy to hear from Dr. Cheever and myself, but was potentially more interested in hearing from you about what your background was and how did you find yourself both involved in HIV and involved in the federal government? And I think we all wanna know. Oh, okay, so this is turning the cameras around. Well, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I actually got involved in HIV in the mid nineties, um, working on a study at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, with some folks. And it was sort of looking at uh, uh, influencers and gatekeepers in communities. Uh, and how they were able to reach folks to get them tested for HIV. And, and it was really about trying to increase the number of folks who were aware of their, their HIV status. 
Um, I moved to DC, uh, finishing up my 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 dissertation research, which was on uh, issues of public housing, and and then that sort of evolved my issue in in housing, social safety net issues, um, and their connection to public health, actually kind of morphed me into working in the field of HIV. Um, and my first federal job uh, many moons ago was actually in this office, uh, uh, really sort of beginning to uh, explore the issue of policy and, and, and program in that in regard. Along the way, I've done everything from stand in parks and pass out condoms to at midnight to, <laughs> to uh, you know, working on various sort of research efforts around, on, around HIV. Um, and I think as for like a lot of people, um, you know, I was personally touched by uh, the, the epidemic, uh, loss of family, uh, a dear brother, friends, cousins, colleagues along the way. And so I think the, 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 the marriaging of the, sort of the personal and the professional, as it is, I think, for a lot of people really sort of brings me here today. And that's why I, sort of, I stay in it. Thank you for that question. Um, I know we're sort of out of time, but I just want to quickly, if we might have, just to go over just a little bit, because uh, there was a question about the connection with COVID, and I think it's really relevant to our times. Um, and that is, what lessons from the body of HIV AIDS work can we leverage to address COVID-19? For example, increasing vaccination rates to community engagement, et cetera. Um, just, just briefly, I would, I would um, add that I think there are a lot of spaces where they can teach each other things um, from our experience. One was act fast. It's easier if you do that. Um, think carefully and use science to make your decisions. Um, uh, public health is inherently political, but it is not inherently partisan. Mm. Um, new technology can make a big difference. Um, make sure it's available to everyone who needs it. And if you just let the world bring your interventions, you will have um, you will you will have increasing disparities. So you have to work, you know, you have to think carefully from the beginning and plan right and implement right. Involve the community. Um, don't ignore the effects of communication, micro influencers and the internet. Um, I will say that um, there's a there's constant articles discussing what we could have done better with COVID. Um, but I think um, one of them really does relate to the environment now of how do you change people's practices and behavior in this new internet driven social media world. And um, I think the, uh, the public health world is, is, is not even just, they're not catching up. We're not catching up. We are, we are behind um, and we need to catch up. Um, so, but I also, um, I think a lot of uh, what HIV has done is integrated communities and people with HIV into decision making, and into um, into the highest levels of government and in and private sector, and continues to um, have a dialogue. And COVID, um, we there will be hundreds of thousands of people with long term effects of COVID, and they they should have a voice. Thank you for that. Lord, Dr. Schaefer, do you have any? Yeah, I think uh, I completely agree with everything John has said. I think it for it's really about also at this point uh, in terms of getting people vaccinated, trusted messengers and safe spaces. That um, that that you know if you're going to reach them through a TV ad, you would already reach them probably by now. So it really is about making sure you have those one-on-one -on -one handoffs uh, with with trusted medical providers, with trusted friends, with people in the community, religious leaders. Who are those trusted people? that can really bring the messages to people that have not yet gotten vaccinated. Um, the other thing that I think um, we, we saw in COVID and we've seen here before is, is uh, or with HIV is, is denialism. HIV denialism was devastating to some populations in some places and COVID denialism is as well. Yes, important reminders from both of you. Um, as we wrap up, I really want to thank you both for joining us, uh, Dr. Chivas and Dr. Merman. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, and your sage words around uh, HIV and, and other related issues. Um, to our audience, thank you for participating. Please visit hiv.gov for additional information about activities related to ending the HIV epidemic 
and HHS commemoration of the 40th anniversary of HIV. Please also register for the next Live with Leadership session on June 22nd at 4 p.m. as part of our National HIV Testing Day.